Hello, good evening, good morning, wherever you're joining us from around the world. I think we are live now on YouTube. And thank you very much for taking time out of your busy lives to join us for this very special panel discussion on the toxic effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals and how they can impact not just our bodies, but also our planet. And we're focusing particularly on those through plastic period products. So, um, 
I'm Natalie Fay. I'm the founder of City to Sea. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I'm your host for this evening. Um, we're going to be live for about an hour. There's going to be a chance to ask our amazing panelists for um, ask your questions. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. So first of all, a little bit about City to Sea. We're a not-for-profit campaigning organization focusing on stopping single-use plastic at source. Some of you may know us already some of you may be joining for the first time and you're very welcome here um, we tend to focus on the most commonly uh, found items of single-use plastic on our rivers and seas around the world and our campaigns focus on those particularly practical grassroots behavior change initiatives um, and of course as part of our campaign portfolio we have since 20 17 been focusing on plastic free periods and focusing on the hidden plastics found in period products. So we'll tell you more about that later. Um, and before I introduce you to the experts that are here this evening, they're not just experts, they're amazing human beings. Um, I just wanted to thank our partner NatureCare for supporting this event this evening. Now I'm a huge fan, like a genuine huge fan of NatureCare. I've been using their products for eons. Um, a Bristol-based natural period product brand um, who've pioneered plastic-free periods literally since the end of the 1980s. Uh, so there genuinely is no one better to be bringing you tonight's event. So thank you for that. Um, so this could turn toxic. I mean, hopefully we're not going to get toxic between us um, and neither are you, but you're welcome to, you know, pose us some challenging questions. We're going to be having a deep dive into endocrine disrupting chemicals. We're going to explore what they are, um, what effect they have on us and the planet, and of course, how to avoid them. Genuinely, I personally know very little about them, so I'm really looking forward to this evening's discussion. Um, and I'm just going to tell you who we've got here on the panel. Um, so firstly, we've got our virtual panellist, um, Dr. Neetu Bajakal. Um, Dr. Neetu is an MD senior consultant obstetrician and gynaecologist in the UK with over 35 years of clinical experience in women's health. Her special interests include lifestyle medicine, PCOS, which I believe is polycystic ovary syndrome. syndrome. Thank you, Maria. Um, period problems, precancer, and medical medical education. Dr. Neetu is also an author and a fellow of the Royal College and recipient of the Indian President's Gold Medal. She's one of the first board certified lifestyle medicine physicians in the UK. Give us a wave, Dr. Neetu. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Amazing. We'll come to you very shortly. Um, may I also introduce you all to Susie Hewson. Susie is a true eco-warrior, a pioneer and, respo and responsible for having developed NatureCare, the world's first brand of organic and natural period products in 1989. Feels like a long time ago now. Yeah, looks like a long time ago as well. No, it doesn't. <laughs> um, Susie founded NatureCare when she discovered the harmful chemicals and plastic used in products already on the market. Um, and so Susie tonight will be talking about the role of the companies uh, to reduce chemicals in period products as well as her experience in that. Um, it's a real honour to have you um, and thanks for being here. Next up, we have Charlotte Lloyd. So Charlotte's an environmental chemist with research interests in the transport and fate of pollution, including plastics and bioplastics. I love that term, the fate of pollution. <laughs> um, and nutrients in the terrestrial environment. So basically that means we're gonna be talking about how EDCs affect the planet and, and the, not just the, um, the oceans, but the soil as well. I'm getting that from the terrestrial bit. That's yeah, what I'm that's getting right. there. Um, her current work at the University of Bristol woo, combines cutting edge laboratory analysis with data interrogation techniques to investigate particularly the impact of chemical additives from plastics on the natural environment. So um, thanks for joining us, Charlotte. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, Thank you. And last but not least, we've got actor and filmmaker and founder of the production company Falling Films, Maria oh. Webb. Um, so after experiencing problems with her own menstrual cycle, Maria set out to change the way we talk and think about women's health by telling her story through film. And they are amazing as well. Um, and Maria's really been pioneering some um, brilliant conversations and film recently. So thanks, Maria, for thank being you. here. 
Um, and of course, uh, a huge welcome to all of you that are joining us. So for viewers at home, if you've got any questions this evening, we're going to be having a Q&A after um, our discussion. Um, there's a number of ways. Well, there's two ways, actually, that you can um, be in, in touch with us. So you can either, if you've got a YouTube account, um, send us your questions by typing them in the comments. So we've got the comments open, or is there a live chat going on? We've got Sophie here from City to See behind the scenes as well. We've got live chat going on. So you can put your questions as and when they arise, and then Sophie will give us those questions afterwards. Um, or you can save them for the end and type them in. Or if you don't have a Google account, which I think you need to put that in, um, you can just email sophie at city2c.org.uk. That's sophie at city2c.org.uk. Um, we'd love to hear from you. So um, we'll have a nice chat later on. You can ask any questions that you have. So let's start by getting to know you all a little bit more. Um, Apart from us inviting you onto the panel, I'm going to lean in a bit so you can see me. Um, I can see you, don't worry. Um, Dr. Nito, tell us a little bit about what brings you here tonight. Um, I think this is an area that uh, medical professionals haven't talked about enough. Uh, and being an obstetrician and gynecologist for over 35 years, probably coming up to 37 years, I started medical school years and years ago. But nothing much has changed when we talk about environmental hazards uh, and plastics especially are something that, well, generally, you know, all, all the, the environmental toxins are not really discussed with when we see women uh, or those who are assigned female at birth to talk about, you know, menstrual disorders or uh, you know, pregnancy or miscarriages and pregnancy loss. There's so much that we could do to uh, inform our patients, but I think doctors themselves and health professionals themselves don't have very much idea at all. And so I felt, um, for me, when I, I knew when I started medical school that uh, I wanted to become a surgeon, but I also wanted to have um, the medical side of things, and ops and gynae was absolutely the perfect speciality for me. But as the years went by, I felt that there was something missing in my toolbox and I had myself become vegan about 22 years ago. I've always been a vegetarian for ethical reasons. And so it seemed very logical when I started reading the information that there was a lot of science uh, based on all the lifestyle things that we could do and the, whether that was avoiding risky substances or the food that we put in our mouth or, or the air that we inhale and the stuff that we put on our skin. And so one of my special interests is also vulval problems because I see a lot of issues uh, that can come. So although I do surgery and prescribe medications, I also look at the person uh, in a holistic way. And so uh, that's what drew me to become a lifestyle medicine professional as well, so I can actually be qualified to talk about these things, because we were never taught any of this in medical school. Mm. And so I hope that I'll be able to contribute to the conversation. We've talked about endocrine disrupting chemicals in our book. Uh, uh, my book just came out in May. It's uh, Living Polycystic Ovary Syndrome Free Living. PCOS free, three out of four women will nev don't, never get a diagnosis and one in 10, and we think actually one in four women in subgroups actually have the condition, but nobody's joining the dots. And uh, so I'll, I'll talk about those aspects when we have a discussion. So I hope, um, I live in London, I uh, grew up in India, I have two rescue dogs, I <laughs> love my job, I never want to retire, uh, and I want to keep writing, I want to keep educating and empowering women and that's my passion ah that's so fantastic thank you so much i can literally feel your energy and your enthusiasm and um, beaming out of the screen um absolutely one of the reasons why i'm on tiktok and instagram at 60 <laughs> is to educate uh, the younger generation because there is a little bit of lethargy in my generation they don't want to wake up to the real effects that we are having on our planet and you know i feel really sorry for the younger generations for you all and for the generations to come mm. and, and you touched on some really interesting statistics there so we'll definitely pick up on those later on and i love that i love the idea of lifestyle medicine like hadn't really heard of that before so i mean yes more of you please um we'll definitely come back to you soon thank you dr need um 
Susie, let's hear from you. So, so other than obviously you've got an invite to come and join us this evening, um, tell us a bit about your journey. Um, well, I started um, as an environmentalist. I've been an environmentalist all my life. Um, looking at the, uh, through Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, looking at dioxin pollution. Um, and in 1988, 89, there was a World in Action program about dioxin pollution in watercourses um, coming from pulp in, the pulping industry. Prior to that time in the early 80s, I'd lived in Sweden um, and I used to cycle to college and every morning I'd cycle past a reen that was part of a pulping feminine hygiene plant um, and it was a different color every day. So to me, it connected that there was an issue here. Um, I tried to start a campaign to get manufacturers to change. Um, there was, it was very clear that they were not admitting any, any issue that was um, going to make them to change. So that then stimulated me to create my own product. To, to com I knew that it's okay to tie yourself to a tree, you know, as an environmentalist, climb up it, whatever you do, but to put something in that competes um, necessarily drives change. So the, 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 the process was really to, to create a product, but carry on campaigning to raise awareness and um, be mindful that there were no, there's no internet when I started. Um, and to get um, voice in, in media was very difficult because the advertising schedules would, you know, look at editorial and conversations that I were having were not ones that wanted to, they would be published. Um, so really it was a sort of war of attrition between myself and the, the giant manufacturers out there um, to put forward what the issues were, what I was seeing, um, the pulping industry, the use of plastics. Um, single use disposal was something that was quite new even then um, in the feminine hygiene industry and incontinence products, menstrual products in general, um, baby diapers. But this impacted across all paper, all the paper industry. So for me to come in there as a, who are you? I, I, well, I, I trained as a graphic designer and a teacher. I wasn't in business. Wow. Um, so everything I had to do was to learn very quickly to go up this, the, the learning curve of what, what the processes were, what, were this, what was the legislation. Is there, I had moles in the European Union, who were NGOs, <laughs> who were trying to help me to bring menstrual products under regulation as they are in North America. Um, and it was such a the, such the position and strength of lobbyists within the industry that that didn't happen. Um, so it was really a process of keep going, keep getting the message out, put a product into market, stand up to legal challenges as has been continuous mm. throughout the time because um, I've always put my judgment in anything I say. I, I will only say something that I know I can defend in court and I've never had to be in court and I've shooed away quite a few high quality lawyers in my time. Um, so it really is... Um, to, to raise awareness about what, what goes on in the industry, mm. what, what to drive change by working with um, sustainable and renewables, um, to make sure that the brand gets pushed forward, is spoken about, in order to drag up to my front line the rest of the industry. Um, and over the past years, that's been happening a little bit. Um, regulation, I've been working with regulators to get, because there's nothing that drives change more than regulation. And I'm, you know, I'm a strong proponent of regulation in the industry and there's very little of it. Um, even if the perceived idea that there is a lot of reg regulation, you'd be surprised how little there is, mm -hmm. which is why these materials can be used in these kind of products without really much control. Yeah. I, I definitely, let's come back to the regulation thing as well later, but I, I just love that thing of you just as an activist it was like but how can i make that change and, and what you did was was disruptive in that mm. you tried to just do something else within within the industry that would make a change and i think we are we're starting to see aren't we sort of well obviously now lots of our brands coming out with plastic free period products or plastic free disposable period products um in the space but um i love the fact that it was your experience of seeing these reens which if you don't know what they are by the way um Reen is like we have them in Somerset and I think in Norfolk as well. It's like where the land has been has been drained. Um, which camera, Harry? That one. That one, good. That one. Um, 
I think the reens are really cool. Like here in Bristol, you can see when the tide's in, the reens go up about 11 centimetres just when the tide's in. But the fact that you were seeing those change literally with the chemicals that were coming from those factories mm -hmm. is outrageous. Greens, reds, all sorts of colours. Yeah. Um, horrible. And one of the reasons um, for me starting City to See it was see it, cycling along the River Avon here in Bristol and seeing those the islands of plastic floating down the Avon that inspired me. But anyway, great. Thanks for being here. Looking forward to chatting more. Um, Charlotte, your turn. Um, Tell us about you. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm a scientist at the University of Bristol. Um, as you said, I'm an environmental chemist um, and um, kind of my interest was in trying to track all kinds of different um, chemical pollution in, in the environment. So I've looked at things from cattle slurry to sewage Ooh. to I uh, get all the glamorous yeah. jobs. Um, I feel you. Yeah. <laughs> and so for me, plastic was just another example of a kind of organic pollution that was being um, uh, put into our, our environment. And so um, there were a lot of methods that we'd already developed for other um, types of chemistries that we could kind of directly apply to the plastic problem. Um, so I'm kind of interested in you know, all different types of plastic um, and how they, they um, get into the environment. And particularly, I'm interested in the chemicals associated mm. with, the, with the plastic being a chemist. So while I think the microplastics are an important part of the story, they are only one part of the story. And so I was uh, really pleased to see um, that you were going to be talking about chemicals from the plastic uh, today, because actually um, that's something that is very rarely talked about, either in the media or really it's only just emerging in the kind of scientific context as well um, from an environmental perspective. So the literature is very much lagging behind um, on the chemical side of things. Um, there are plethora of papers. I mean, I can't keep up with the number of scientific papers that are published every week on microplastics in, you know, in various scenarios. Um, but the chemical data um, is definitely lagging behind. So that was something that I've been trying to um, trying to address. So I've currently got money from the Royal Society, um, who are funding me for uh, for the next five years to look at hey. the yeah yay uh, to look at the um, the impact of chemicals from plastics um, in the environment. So um, some of that focus is on um, the use of plastics in agriculture, um, so plastic films, um, but they, um, but the same applies to all the other types of plastic we've got in our lives, including the, the period products. Um, so I think it's really great to be talking about the, what I call the invisible pollution yeah. from plastic, yeah. um, because we have no idea really um, what the overall impact on the environment will be um, of this extra chemical burden that we've been putting on the environment. As you mentioned, so my work covers um, soils as well as rivers. Um, and of course that then goes to the ocean, um, and which obviously is really important, but I think the, the marine setting often gets more airtime um, than, the, than the rivers and particularly the soils. They're particularly understudied. Yeah. Um, and so we don't really know what the impact of these chemicals um, will be on soil ecosystems and that's, that's so important for food generation. <laughs> we need our soils, we need healthy soils um, in order to function as a, as a society. So really important to kind of join all these things together. So yeah. great to be able to discuss this I'm today. I'm so glad we're <laughs> having that conversation too, because I think uh, there was a study uh, a while back, I think that said that there were 27 times more microplastic um, microplastics now in our soil per square meter than there are in the ocean per square meter yeah. and then starting to hear that the food that we're growing are starting absorbing the chemicals from that and um, I think it's hugely important that we start talking about that and it's not like you say with the invisible side of things it's 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 harder to sort of make a noise about it and to get people sort of outraged about it but even in terms of like the amount of microplastics and nanoplastics that we're breathing in mm -hmm. is now shocking, like apparently like up to 7,000 a day for children. Um, you know, we know plastic doesn't break down. So, you know, what's that going to be doing in our lungs? So yeah. great work. And we're going to dive into that this evening. We might be here sometime. <laughs> um, Maria. Um, your turn. Tell us a little bit about what what brings you here. Your journey of becoming aware of um, toxic chemicals in plastic in in period products. Um, 
Yeah, my journey started about seven years ago when I came off the pill, which is kind of what got me interested in menstrual cycles um, because I came off the pill and lost it, <laughs> basically, which I think a lot of people I've heard can relate to. And um, and so I went to the doctor and said, what's going on? I don't... Do you mean mentally? Yeah, in like every way. Like I didn't get... My menstrual cycle didn't come back. I wasn't getting a period. Um, I got really bad symptoms of like anxiety and depression. My skin was breaking up and went to the doctor and said, I don't understand what's happening. You told me that the pill would fix this and I've been on it for seven years now and it's done nothing. Mm -hmm. And the only option they gave me was to go back on the pill. And that kind of like sparked, I guess, like the anger in mm -hmm. me where I was just like, how can this be the only thing? And why is my menstrual cycle, which is something that's really natural, why is there like, why do I have to have this like band-aid to fix it, like the pill? Like, there, is there like an underlying condition? And I got a lot of things thrown at me, like um, Dr. Nitu will probably, she would have heard all of these as well, like PCOS was thrown at me. Um, I was told things like that I wasn't ovulating so I couldn't have children and wow. none of this was true. Um, and it was after kind of some digging and help from family and friends that I managed to find a hormone specialist and a naturopath who like took one look at my medical records and was like, oh, your hormones are imbalanced. You just need to like cut out a lot of um, like inflammatory foods, basically take some magnesium, some zinc and just let things settle down because you've just had a bunch of toxins in your body and it's trying to sort that out. Mm. And so I did that and within three months I was fine. <laughs> and so yeah. it was like this journey of seven years to three months. And um, that pissed me off even more <laughs> and made me want to look into it even more. And by doing that, I started to actually learn about like, what is a menstrual cycle? Or I like to just call it my cycle because I like to acknowledge all parts of it, not mm. just the bleed. And I started to learn incredible things about myself and like what I was capable of doing and like the kind of power and magic that comes with having a cycle and would get so excited I'd talk to more people about it and they'd be like, I want to learn about this and then made YouTube videos about it because I loved it even more and before I knew it, people were like, you're an activist. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've decided to take that on and share the message further. Yeah, amazing. And there's there's so many, of, especially our young people, that are just, you know, just stay on the pill for years and years and then aren't connected to their menstrual cycle. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, really, and, and don't even have periods and, you know, all kinds of um, problems associated with that. But uh, great, looking forward to hearing more from you mm -hmm. this evening. So thank you all. That's really lovely to get a sense of, of who you are and why you're here. I feel very privileged that we've got you all here with us um, this evening. So I'd love to just sort of get the basics right. Um, there might be people watching that are like, what's endocrine? What does an EDC mean? Um, so let's kind of just do a little bit of a sort of 101 on what are endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, and let's start by looking at how they're negatively affecting our body. So Dr. Nitu, if I could come to you, first of all, to explain what are EDCs? Um, maybe just for people who don't even know what the endocrine system is, give us a little overview of that um, and, and maybe just then explain how they might be negatively affecting our bodies. Sure. Um, so before we talk about EDCs, we have to understand, as you said, the endocrine system and what are hormones. Uh, the endocrine system is spread out throughout our entire body. There are a number of organs that release these chemical messengers, which are called hormones. Uh, and the magic of these hormones are that they are secreted in one part of the body usually, and they work their effect on a distant part of, of the body. So for example, you have hormones released by your brain, uh, that there's a master controller switch, which is called the hypothalamus that works on another little organ in your brain called the pituitary, which then again works on your ovaries. And so you can imagine that all these have a very interconnected uh, relationship. Just like people know about the thyroid, again, you have hormones released by your brain that uh, then work on the thyroid gland and hormones are essential for the working of the body. They, without hormones, you can't actually live. So it's so important that when these hormones 
I don't like using the word imbalance because that is not really a medical term. Uh, what you want to say is that basically these hormones get disrupted. Uh, and when hormones get disrupted uh, by certain uh, uh, chemicals, then that those are endocrine disrupting chemicals. And these are usually present in the environment from various. You may inhale it, you may ingest it, you may have it through your skin. Uh, these are disruptions that are caused and your hormones then don't behave necessarily. Or these endocrine disrupting chemicals may also mimic the hormones that you have. So that's also important to understand. And I would like to come back at some point uh, to talk about the pill because it's an area of great special interest for me. And I want to set a few things straight, but we will talk about that when we have a break. But I hope I've explained what endocrine disrupting chemicals are. They basically disrupt the hormones that are the chemical messengers that signal the functioning of many of our organs, including our reproductive organs. Thank you. That does. Uh, and like, what what can what are the effect of, of them? So it's still staying with you for a moment. Um, so, yeah. So it really depends. There's probably no part of the body that is not affected. Um, but if we are going to focus on the because we're talking about periods and 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 plastics and things, uh, those EDCs can start affecting oogenesis. So those who are assigned female at birth and women are born with a number of eggs. So around five months when you're in your mother's stomach, you would have about six or seven million eggs um, that are, are uh, start developing and then they go into sort of um, go to sleep. They go to sleep and, and by the time you're born, about five of those million eggs have been destroyed naturally by a process called follicular atrium. They just get destroyed. And by the time you're born, you're one to two million eggs. And then what happens is by the time you reach puberty, when your ovaries are receiving the signals from your brain to wake up, then about there are about half a million eggs. Again, there's been a lot of natural loss. There's nothing you can do to uh, to increase that uh, number of eggs or reduce. It's not like sperm that regenerate every 72 days. And, and then by the time you're 31, you will have about 100,000 eggs. And then by the time you're 37, you'll have uh, further less eggs. And by the time you... Uh, the average person hits menopause around the age of 51, the number of eggs in your ovaries drop to a critical level. So endocrine disrupting chemicals can start affecting even your grandmother or your mother, because at the end of the day, these are known as epigenetics. So these chemicals can last for a long time and affect the way these eggs or oocytes are, are produced and or generated and may be responsible for conditions like premature uh, menopause, what is known as primary uh, or premature ovarian insufficiency. I myself went through premature um, menopause at the age of 38. And so you can imagine that can have quite significant consequences if the way those eggs either develop they may develop abnormally, so that might result in more miscarriages uh, and pregnancy loss. They may result in congenital defects. They may result in menstrual disorders, including polycystic ovary syndrome, which we'll talk a little bit about, as well as going on in pregnancy problems. So, And those sort of uh, EDCs can come from many places. Those who eat tuna and swordfish, they will have high levels of lead and mercury. Those who uh, have lots of environmental dental assistance may uh, be exposed to high levels of nitrous oxide, anesthetists. Mm -hmm. So you can have them from various sites. Uh, so, you know, every single aspect of the reproductive phases of life can be affected uh, through these um, endo endotoxins or endocrine disrupting chemicals that can come in various guises. There are so many ways. Uh, medications don't really form part of that, neither does most food, but you can have these chemicals seeping into them and as a result causing problems in the water, in the food, in the soil, like uh, Charlotte was saying. Just quickly, does it affect men too? Because obviously we've talked about... Of course, how it... of course it affects men, definitely, um, because you're feeding, uh, you know, cattle and animals, lots of food uh, that contain, um, you know, lots and lots of chemicals that have been added to them, for example. Uh, but there are, again, a lot of misconceptions that can the pill cause uh, issues. And just to go back to the period side of things, you have to remember that 150 years ago, uh, the average life expectancy for most people were about, was about 35 or 40, okay, especially for women. Mm. The, you would start your periods around the age of 14 or 15, you would have a period, you would probably get pregnant, and then either you'd die in childbirth or you would have a baby, and that baby would be nursed for three, four years, and then you'd find yourself pregnant again. And so the cycle would continue 
until you either died in childbirth, which, which a lot of women did, and those who didn't reached, um, had about 10 or 15 periods in, our, in their lifetime. So if you think periods, having periods is a natural uh, evolutionary thing, it is not. Most people compared to 10 or 15 periods, now we have 500 cycles in our wow. lifetimes. So that is important to understand. And of course that then has a huge effect uh, on the amount of menstrual products we use. You know, not everybody is using reusable pads or like I grew up using cloths mm -hmm. uh, in India, yeah? So it's just important to understand that it's really, if you are not on hormonal medication, you really need to understand your cycle, your menstrual cycle. And if your cycle is less than 24 days and more than 35 days, or if it's lasting more than 10 days, or if you find that it is heavy, it doesn't matter, your doctor doesn't have to tell you that, those things are not a, are not normal. Mm. So if you're missing periods, like uh, the young lady who was uh, mentioning about how she did not have periods after she stopped the pill, the pill doesn't actually affect the amenorrhea. It is what, it depends on body weight, it depends on the hormones that are going on, what are the underlying conditions that may be there. And it's really sad that nobody actually dropped, went to the root cause uh, rather than, uh, you know, focusing on what had actually happened. The pill does not stop your period or do anything. It just gives you the contraception or it, it, it basically looks at symptoms that you may have from other conditions, acne, excess hair, and also very effective contraception. Not everybody's in a position of privilege not to be on the pill because having a pregnancy is much more dangerous and an unwanted pregnancy may be even more dangerous, especially with what is happening in the US, for example, right now. Sure. Okay, so it is, it's fine using natural methods, but they are not effective. 20% failure rate compared to you know, less than 1% failure rate with the pill. So amazing. I needed Thank to you. make that clear. Yeah, mm -hmm. really important to, to highlight some of those some of those things. Yeah. Um, and really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, Susie, what kind of what kind of products and chemicals are we talking about then with these that, that then are EDCs? Like you mentioned dioxins earlier, like what mm -hmm. what kind of chemicals and uh, things are we talking about here? Well, um, the first thing to, to, to know is that most products that are commercially available, that are disposable, are almost n over 90% plastic. Are we talking about period products? Period products, yeah. incontinence products, baby diapers. The same, they're the same construction, just bigger. Um, so polypropylene, polyethylene, um, superabsorbent is a microplastic um, in the environment. Um, it doesn't disappear. Um, and, and also, um, it, there's changes in the sort of industry that's producing uh, cellulose, reconstituted cellulose, and additives to that to improve the performance. So these are undisclosed processes. There's no, there's so much protection of proprietary information r around production. It's really difficult to get a single manufacturer to declare all things. And in the plastics process, there, there's all sorts of mixtures. I mean, you all know this is hundreds of ingredients that go into plastics. And along with that are, are um, you know, plasticizers, additives, preservatives, you know, that will, whatever the end product is likely to be, um, whether it's a semi-rigid plastic or a, a rigid plastic, there are different additives that go into there, but they're all proprietary information. Recently, so that means they don't have to declare. No, what's that? and there, and if you, and as I said previously, you know, there's control of, of medical devices in in North America, um, Korea, uh, Japan, uh, Mexico, even, but they're not they're they're not medical devices in Europe. So all fem, feminine hygiene products, incontinence products are. Um, but period products are not. Um, that was probably, as I said earlier, attributed to lobbying mm. from the industry. So there is also, um, in producing products, you only have to make a declaration that you are conforming to good general products processes. There's, there's no one's, there's no overarching organization that's saying these materials are acceptable, these chemicals in these materials are acceptable. The, the European Union, um, has an on our harmonized list of chemicals and there's a reach there's a reach list um, like in America there's proposition 65 if you're on that list there are controlled chemicals and if you're producing a product and it has a controlled chemical you have to declare it on your MSDS and your material safety data sheet as a, a, a chemical of concern 
um, and there'll be limits to how much of that chemical can be in the process. Um, but recent studies that, I guess when, when, when organizations like City to Sea or, or Nature Care or other campaigners are raising awareness, um, different organizations, um, for instance, in France, ANSI, um, which is like the Food and Drug Administration in France, they decided to take a look at um, menstrual products to see if they could find out. They couldn't get information from the supply chain, so they had to do their own analysis. Um, and, and what they found is um, out of 21 chemicals that they, they identified from pads and pads and panty liners, half of them were, were, were not necessarily, they would, didn't need to be on the harmonized list. Um, but four, um, I think it was like four out of the 21 chemicals ID'd were uh, considered to be a high risk um, and are, are on the harmonized list as a high risk. There's nothing to say that you can't, you can't use that. Um, so there's no regulation or control. Through, uh, th after ANSI looked at that, they made recommendations to the European Union that regulation should be brought in to define what the limit should be for use of those chemicals. But they have no, they have no, there is no power because the lobbying industry, which is in the Europe is Zidana, in the US is Indra, who are uh, you know, a conglomerate of the largest producers mm. globally, um, have a voice. Um, and there's reasons why you know, regulations don't come in. Um, so it's down to, to testing agencies, be they independently looking into these issues. Sweden, Kemi looked at it also. Um, but, but to be mindful that in the use of these materials, because there is no regulation, there's no control or innovation, because these materials are cheap to produce. Mm -hmm. They're petrochemicals, they're polyolefins, they're cheap. Um, they're, they're standard, so they're their patents that have been out there for a long time are, you know, modified slightly. Um, but it's like, um, as a consumer, you're never going to get that information. The US just recently drove a campaign, um, the NRDC, to get labeling of ingredients put onto packaging. Um, but what you'll find on the packaging is ingredients that were um, deliberately intended to be put in the product. So you get a basic list of ingredients, mm. um, processing aids, additives, chemicals involved up the chain of making those in the product will not be declared on there, mm. but they'll be present. And equally, e even, um, well, we use organic products, we use compostable materials. Um, when we do um, precautionary testing, we do precaution testing for organic cotton because we feel we, we should. And when we send testing off and, and the agency that we use would say, well, can you tell us where this cotton comes from? And I said, does it make a difference? And he said, well, most certainly does. As for the record, our, our, our organic cotton comes from Kyrgyzstan. Um, it's organic, got certified, it's whatever. But, uh, and, and the reason why is because DDT is, is uh, in the environment, even though it was banned however many years ago, it's persistent in the environment. So if you, even if you were growing organic cotton in an area that 50 years ago um, was growing cotton using DDT, um, it will still be in the soil. Mm. That's how pernicious these, these materials are. <clears throat> yeah. So really, it's the, the, the onus is on the manufacturers to, to use materials that they have done a research on to find out what is the processing mechanisms. Mm. And if there is things in there that shouldn't be used, that then how do you find another way of doing it? Instead, it's the status quo. What I do is I rattle the cages of those organizations and say, well, we want to try and we want to make sure that these materials are not in our raw materials yeah. and we'll do independent testing. So there is a process for manufacturers to test, to make sure, um, to, to conform, to, to conform and help regulations to come into process. But unless there's pressure up from the medical institutions to say we're seeing this in the environment, in, in our patients, yeah. there's an incidence of this. Um, and, and I know uh, Dr. Neil will know that there's no, whilst the toxicological analyses that they use for these raw materials are from the top down, it's like, what's the maximum amount? And is it, is it below that maximum amount? Whereas some research indicates that you should look from the bottom up 
because we're exposed to these things over multiple areas. And so there are like definitely studies showing that um, EDCs found in plastics, or yes. that the, there are EDCs in plastics. Oh, yes, yeah. EDCs from formaldehyde, yeah. um, dioxin, furans. They're, they're BPA EDCs. is that BP, one of them? BPA. Well, BPA yeah. is it more in. I mean, if you've all got your mobile phones out, that rigid plastic around your mobile phone is full of BPA. Um, so it, it's it's used to stop plastic that. smashing. If every time you're using it, every time you walk across the carpet, and, and um, particularly with then with period products, we're talking about products that we put inside us, um, yeah. or that we have like very close to areas where our skin, I guess, is more absorbent. So closer it's than you think, because recent studies done at Middlesex here, that was published in December 2021, and you'll probably know that, um, looked at brands of products that that were either had a, 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 a natural organic cotton core or a cotton core or a viscose core with a polypropylene overwrap and a plastic applicator, that they measured the, the amount of nanoplastics that yeah. were shed into the mucosa of the vagina. Yeah. Um, and it's not just about the plastic that's shed, it's the, it's the chemicals that are used that leach out and yeah. what is the impact. But the, you, people can't say they're safe because it's, it's unethical to do toxicological analysis on a human being to find out into the future mm. what impacts it's going to have. But we do know that those chemicals are associated with long-term cancer um, and birth defects. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's a mess because there is no regulation. There's no one controlling the industry. Mm. Hugely important then that, that this is talked about more, bless you, uh, and discussed more and, and more people are campaigning on it mm -hmm. and we find those, those lever points. Um, so um, let's talk a bit more about, um, well, firstly, Maria, before, before we move on to how it's affecting sort of the, 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 uh, the environment, like, did you come across EDCs sort of when you started your journey into looking at sort of, I'd say like period empowerment or like reclaiming your cycle? Was that something that you became aware yeah. of? Yeah, a lot of my journey and like my awareness came from just what I, like self-discovery. So I did a lot of journaling and like figured things out for myself and then would like go and research and be like, oh, like my feelings have been verified in this paper or whatever. But um, I definitely noticed when I switched to using a menstrual cup mm -hmm. um, and got rid of like single use period products that, um, and, I, and I don't think I realized it at the time, but I just remember um, feeling more comfortable while I had a period. And it was really, like I still had cramps and things like that, but I just, it, it's really hard to describe. It was a feeling that I had inside me <laughs> that was just that just made me feel more connected to the period and then when I started to learn about endocrine disruptors I was like that's got to be like a part of it that all of a sudden I'm eliminating this toxin from my body and I can just feel it mm, really interesting so more like a, a kind of deeper body wisdom like a, a yeah. felt sense of that yeah. sort of Which felt is better like for you a huge thing that the menstrual cycle does for you yeah thanks um so Charlotte, I mean, let's let's talk about how EDCs are affecting our environment because obviously there are vast amounts of them um, coming into our environment at the moment. I imagine, you know, getting into our food chain. Um, over to you. I mean, I'd, I'd love you to tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, sure. Um, I'd like to also pick up on what Susie said about um, the uh, kind of lack of transparency in the industry, because actually when we started looking at plastics in the environment, the first thing we wanted to do was work out, well, what are the important compounds that we should or shouldn't be worried about that are in these products? And of course, no one would tell us um, what, what was being used. And so the first thing that we have to do if we're interested in the impact of a particular product or a particular type of plastic is first to um, hone our methods to take the plastic apart and work out what is in it. And it's like, well, people already know what's in it, they made it, but no one will tell us. So we have to do all that work first <laughs> uh, to take it apart, to work out what additives are actually in there. Um, and then- and No not... doubt you have to like fight for funding to actually yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah, and... e exactly. Um, so, and actually some of the, you know, if you're talking about plastic, production, a lot of those um, companies who are making the plastic, they will buy their additives in as a kind of mix. And so actually they don't even know what is in the, the additive mix that they're putting within their films. They'll, they'll know um, that it's, um, you know, it's providing um, 
um, various kind of properties that they want to go into their plastics. So amount of either rigidity or flexibility, depending on what type of plastic they're trying to make, uh, whether it needs to be particularly um, flame retardant or whether it needs to be um, uh, UV stable. So how much exposure to sunlight is it, um, is it going to have? And so depending on the type of uh, product, they will tailor the additive um, cocktail, if you like. Um, and so, but they'll buy that in and then make their plastic film or whatever it is, their product from it so they don't necessarily even know exactly what what is in it so so that was always our starting point was trying to work out well, what chemicals are we actually talking about here what what is the most important if you think about um, agricultural use of plastic so the kind of mulch films that we're growing a lot of food through now they lie them on top yeah. of the, the soil um, that's they, like when you when you go past the field and you think it's snowing and you're like no hang on no, it's no, that's it's not snow it's, it's plastic, plastic. yeah <laughs> um, and it's July yeah so, so those plastics can can be can contain up to kind of 10% additive of the weight of the plastic. So it's not a small amount wow. of additive. Um, and they're not chemically bound into the plastics either. They're kind of physically bound. Um, and so they're, they're, they're ready to come out <laughs> given mm -hmm. the right conditions. So they, and some of them are very leachable. It does depend on, on, on the compound, um, but a lot of them are quite soluble. They're quite volatile. So if you think about bin bags, if mm. you take a bin bag out of the, the cupboard, this kind of black plastic bin bag, you know that smell you yes. get off the bin bag? Well, that's chemicals coming out of the plastic. They're kind of volatile organic compounds or VOCs um, that are coming out of that, that plastic. So you're already experiencing <laughs> some of those um, organic compounds that are that are in the plastic. Mm. Um, and so, and they're in, um, they're in all of these products that that we're, we're talking about. Um, so as you say, there will be things like BPA. Um, the interesting thing also about that is that if you, so BPA is banned for food packaging, um, at least in UK, Europe, probably in the US as well. Um, and also for all products for um, infants under three. Mm. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that manufacturers can't switch to a slightly different variant such as BPS, <gasps> BPF, no. which is essentially, it still has the same function. It's just a slightly different um, structure. Uh, st slightly different mm. structure, which is not banned. So you know, there are, I think these are the things that we have to be careful of. So while something might say your bottle is BPA free, you don't know for sure that it's free of all the bisphenols. Right. Um, so I think there is a move to try and you know move away from 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 those kind of compounds, but you can't guarantee it because they don't tell you what they put in there instead. Um, so, um, so BPA, we see a lot in the environment. We see it in river water, um, phthalates, so the other big plasticizer. Um, so is it, like in river water, for example, so is that getting there through our sewage system or is it runoff from the land? Like how would, how would it be getting into the fresh water? Yeah, so there are a variety of ways. So there, uh, so both. Um, so mm. it will be coming through the sewage system um, in two ways. You've got some that will go straight through the sewage works and it, it's not necessarily removed during sewage treatment. So it comes out the other end. So that could be like microfibers? De it, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that, some, some microfibers. Uh, some will be retained within uh, the sewage treatment works, but the chemicals, they're more likely okay, to come yeah. through because they're quite recalcitrant. So they're not very easily broken down by the kind of microbial. Is that what recalcitrant Yes, yeah, so they're very long living. Okay. Yes, so they're, they're not very easily broken down by the kind of microbial communities living within the, um, the sewage treatment works, which is an important part of that, um, uh, that treatment process. Yeah. Um, and so they will come out of the other side um, so anything that is retained in the sewage works, however, you get sewage sludge, yeah. uh, so biosolids, and that we use as a fertilizer. They call it cake mm. as well, don't they? They yeah, yeah, make it yeah. sound really delicious. Sludge cake. Yeah, sludge cake. I, I've analyzed many a sludge cake in oh, my, in lucky my you. career. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so these will be applied to land yeah. as a you know good way of recycling. Which in, the, in theory, which, it should be a great way yeah. of using our poo to then fertilize the land. Yeah, absolutely. But it will also be chock full of pharmaceuticals, um, chemicals from plastics, microplastics. So it's one, they, they, they think that it's one of the biggest source of microplastics to the land is actually coming from sewage sludge. You'll also have irrigation from wastewater um, that's kind of recycled water, which 
equally you think great idea yeah um, but it's also then putting um, putting more of these chemicals um, onto the land so um, some of them are airborne as you say so you've also got wind deposition um, okay. of, of, of these as well um, so and it might be from kind of bigger pieces of plastic so littering um, it might be microplastics it might be the chemicals on their own mm. um, what we don't really understand yet is exactly how these chemicals move in the environment how far can they move so once they're in the soil um, do they get transported to rivers well yes we think they do but this, the the things that i'm working on at the moment is really understanding well how quickly do they move um, do they um, what we call bioaccumulate in the soil um, are they um, affecting the uh, microbial community who live in the soil um, like the mycelium networks yeah things yep. like that all, all of those things and and that will influence the um, the functioning of the soil which is crucial uh, for us to live. We need our soil to be healthy, yeah. to maintain food security um, and yeah. all the other kind of ecosystem function um, to have a kind of healthy landscape in which we're, we're living. Uh, but we don't really know um, what these chemicals are actually doing um, to, to that environment. Um, some of these additives will also be included in bioplastics. So although they're not petroleum based. I think we needed like dun 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 <laughs> on that so, thing. I mean, we know they're a problem with bioplastics, but I guess there's a hope that, you know, in the transition away from um, fossil fuel based plastics, that mm -hmm. there will still be a place for maybe bioplastics in like hospital environments or things like that. But potentially they've still got those um those additives in them, those harmful additives. Yeah, in them they, as well. they they still need that function to to make them fit for purpose for their job, and that mainly comes from the from the additive. So when it comes to the petroleum based plastics, the pollen themselves, like often they're pretty inert. I mean, they're not. It wouldn't be good to have you know bits of that stuck inside you, um, but. Chemically, they're quite inert. Um, it's the That's a pretty radical thing. So, I mean, I'm, I just have to pick up on that because, so actually it's, it's potentially more the, like the plethora of additives that are added to plastic that are potentially more dangerous for us than the actual plastic itself. That is, that is my, my kind of scientific opinion and that's yeah. what I'm trying that's to... That's what you're here for. Yeah. <laughs> so, so through my work, sure. that is what I'm trying to um, gather enough evidence to actually, you know, move that, move that forward. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. So, so sorry, so Susan, I, if I can, to... I can add to that because um, there was a, a few years ago, there was a, a plethora of um, uh, plant-based plastic applicators, tampons that came onto the market. And I'd already looked at them through uh, an organization, but they came into the market and they were also certified organic, which to me was, a, you know, why is this happening? You know, the global organic textile standard should not be permitting any plastics. You can't even use a plastic coat hanger for an organic dress. So it took me four years to, to challenge the global organic textile standard to get the standard change. And I was able to do that because I, gathered together those plastic applicators that were plant-based plastic applicators. And if you want the names of the brands, I'm quite happy to supply them to you. Um, and I sent them to Greenpeace Labs in, in Exeter. And they analyzed them and uh, they came back, well, actually, irrespective of what the raw material was, it is still polyethylene. But more concerning to them was the number, and I can show you the documents because mm. I have them with me, the number <laughs> of, uh, which was up to, in some cases, 20 additives that they were able to identify. And there were many that they couldn't identify because they were mixtures right. that were leachable from those products. And, and they, were at, they were surprised um, that this, this could be possible in an area of such you know, high mobility with women using a product that they're putting in and out where they were readily available. Mm. So yes, it, 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 it's, there's not full disclosure. There's a, there's a sort of glory around, oh, this is a wonderful alternative, but it's not necessarily the full story. Yeah, really interesting to hear and, and kind of scary, but good, good to know. Um, that's what we're doing here, really kind of lifting the lid on, on this subject. I just wanted like, as well, like in the marine environment, um, obviously we're at City to Sea, um, I know there's, you know, we're seeing a sort of decline in, um, in sort of whale and dolphin population and fertility, and quite often sort of studies are linking that to chemicals in the ocean. Is that something that you can just tell us a little bit about as well? Or 
I mean, yeah, so um, I think as I said to you earlier, my water is usually slightly shallower than the, <laughs> than the, the marine system. Um, but, but there's, you know, there, there's very strong evidence um, for um, endocrine disruptors to be um, influencing um, the fish population uh, within rivers. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would be of no surprise to me if it was also having the same effect um, in the oceans. So you have in some areas where they're being exposed to these kind of compounds uh, from a plethora of sources, um, as or as already been mentioned, um, that you've got fish that are actually changing sex um, in rivers. I read about that. Yes, yeah. uh, because of the fact that, you know, the same, it, it, it blocks those um, so th hormone receptors. Uh, so that was, so was that from sort of the added <clears throat> amount of like hormone and chemicals as a result of the people being on the pill and those chemicals coming into our waterways or is that more from the chemicals? That we're using, or is it just a kind of toxic soup? It will, yeah. It will be exactly as you put it in this kind of toxic soup. And actually, you know, it kind of goes back to um, what you mentioned earlier about looking at standards and regulation and how we, sh how should we be doing it? The other thing with these chemicals is that the, if we do set a limit on these, um, on these particular chemicals. Um, the limits are always set by um, experiments where they expose organisms to that chemical, but in isolation. But we never see those chemicals on their own. We see them in in a cocktail. Um, so the the other kind of message that we're trying to get across in my work is that you know what is the implication of seeing all of these chemicals as this kind of cocktail that we're exposing ourselves to? Um, and those tests are almost never done. So they'll they'll do them individually. What's the toxicity of? BPA, what's the toxicity of this specific phthalate? But what happens if you put them in together? Because yeah. we know from other applications that that actually that can have a big effect on the um, the impact that it, that it mm. has. So that's yeah. another thing to getting yeah, lots of, of nodding as well from <laughs> from Doctor <laughs> Need to. Um, did you want to? I think I'm conscious of the time, so it's we're we're um, we've been running now for about an hour. Um, Loads more questions that I want to ask you. Um, how are you doing at home? Um, have we got any questions that have that have come in yet? Yeah, we've got a few. So why don't we take a couple of questions and then we'll come back to some of mine and we can make this a bit more of an open conversation. Um, I certainly want to ask you, especially Dr. Nitu, what we can do, um, like you know, personally for our human health. So we'll we'll certainly leave and and discuss solutions and what we can do. But um, Sophie, why don't you? Give us some questions. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, so we've had a question from Christine asking about plastic-free pads. Um, it seems like they still have plastic in them in a waterproof layer. Um, and she'd like to know a little bit more about that. Can someone explain, please? I definitely think that's that your... My that's your, you yes. can major on that one yes, for us. Um, we, we use... Um, uh, EM 13432, which is a <gasps> European regulation. EM 13432. EM 13432, <laughs> um, like a standard, um, which is uh, uh, OK uh, compostable in, so OK compostable domestic, which means that he goes through tests for compost composting. So it's bio, not just biodegradable and compostable isn't the same thing. Mm. So when it biodegrades in the environment, then um, it has to break down into the components that are necessary to grow plants. Uh, and there is also toxicological analysis of that compost also. So there can't be any heavy metals, um, certain amounts of toxins, uh, any, really it has to clear the whole bunch. So um, there are different kinds of bioplastics um, and there's different um, amounts of base material that goes into there. So there can be some bioplastics that can just have like 25% bio-based, mm. they can be 50%, they can be 75%, they can be over 90%. Um, ours is over 90%. Um, clearly there are other additives in there, but they're controlled under the OECO test. Right. Um, but clearly there is more to be done. Um, so the, the one bio-based material isn't necessarily the same as another. Mm. Um, you really have to look at what what's what analysis has been done, what certification it has. And those those trademarks you really can trust then. So like the is it like Ecotex did you mention or not? Oh, Ecotex oh. is the is the chemical side of it, but for for um the biofilm that we use, it's um turf, 
which is one of the big um, testing agencies. Um, and for us, it took me, it's just now four years, we, not just the one raw material, we put the whole products through EN13432. So our whole product is, is compostable. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Christine, for the question. Um, so, um, got another one there for us? Yep. Thumbs up from Sophie. Okay, with another one. So we've got Kelly asking, why do you think we haven't heard about EDCs before? Why is it not in the mainstream? Mm. Great question. <laughs> um, let's let's start with you, Maria. Like, what y y you kind of went on that journey of, of discovering it for yourself, and mm. maybe didn't find it in the mainstream. So, what what barriers do you think there are? And thanks for that question, by the way. Um, it is a great question. I think um, I think there's a lot of information around menstrual health that's not in the mainstream or even where you'd expect to find it like at a doctor's, like Dr. Neetu was saying, and like my experience, um, I was never really told the complete story of like what the pill does or mm. I never heard the word ovulation really until I was in my 20s. And so I think if you're not really aware that you even have hormones that are doing things in your body, then you wouldn't ever question something disrupting them. Mm. And so I think it goes quite deep into one, like the medical system and who they're choosing to, like what they're researching and how they're researching it. Um, but then also into like just generally what we know about ourselves, mm. like the knowledge is quite limited. So even like education, like, you know, at school. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. And also like depending on like the type of school you go to, like if it's co-ed or single sex or, yeah. If only there was a free unbiased period education program out there. <laughs> Wait, there is. It's called Rethink Period. Oh no, look, the thing, I'm actually going to have to like put that back up. Look, Rethink Periods is, is our education program where we do talk about things like that. But, you know, we didn't have that, did we, growing up? And, and that's still, you know, few people have access to that. Um, Dr. Nitu, what, what barriers do you think there are to people hearing more about this? Because we heard from Susie as to what some of the barriers are in, in industry and in retail in terms of the lobbying, but from your point of view and a health perspective, what, what barriers do you think there are? I think it starts right from a very young age. I don't think we have enough public health education. I don't think there's enough awareness. In fact, there was a 20, November 2020, I think there was a survey in London uh, where they uh, surveyed a whole um, hundreds of women, I think, uh, and it was quite shocking. One in two uh, of us don't know where our cervix is. One in four don't know where the vagina is. One in 10 women don't know where their reproductive organs are. So, and like Maria just said, uh, you know, not knowing what ovulation is, because if you actually don't understand how the period works, what is your menstrual cycle? What is the purpose of the menstrual cycle? How are you going to even know when it is abnormal? How are you going to know about the fact that your vulva, most people don't know that there's a difference between the vulva and the vagina, for example. And also they don't understand because we, uh, that public awareness campaign hasn't happened. Health education hasn't happened. The politicians, it, it, you know, generally speaking, there's a lot of letting down of, uh, of the general public uh, because this information is not available. So when you don't even know initially how your body functions, how are you going to know what are the things that are going to make it go wrong? You understand? So I, I think that is probably one of the key important things. And also um, all these uh, aspects of women's health uh, and of plastics and periods tend to affect, um, you know, more of the marginalized communities. So women as a whole, then you have children, then you have the elder people who are using uh, incontinence uh, products. So what happens is they are not in the forefront for research and things like that. You know, although I'm an OBGYN, you would expect that there is so much of research, but a lot of the research is biased. A lot of the research is not necessarily focusing on EDCs, for example. There is enough research to show, and you were talking about fertility in fish and, and change of sex. We know that reduced fertility from that same mechanism I was explaining that those very eggs that you're born with uh, are affected from all these microplastics and nanoplastics. There are there is evidence to say that. However, what we don't know is what is the exact amount. Why? Because most of the studies are done on animals. Most of the studies are not translatable. Most of the studies have not been done following human populations. For 
you know, a long time. You need generations because there is something called epigenetics. There's something called these eggs that you're born with. And, it, you know, all these effects will take a long time, even though uh, I think a recent study again showed in 2020 that when you use pads that have all these phthalates and bisphenols and, and these various um, the chemicals, what happens is because of the time of exposure, just like a child is in a nappy or just like you have a pad on for several hours, that duration of exposure is also important. So we know that it can be as high as 20 to 30 percent of all the uh, phthalate ex exposure that you may have in your environment may be coming from your menstrual uh, products. What? So can you say that so, again, that repeat that statistic? Because so, that's quite so that's... basically all of us are exposed to uh, many of these environmental toxins. OK, these disrupting chemicals. But there are some some specific chemicals that are actually concentrated in these products. And because the vulva and the vagina do have better absorption, not as much as the gut or anything, but still uh, enough for more of these to be absorbed. So depending upon the product, it can range from 1% up to 30% of your entire total dose. It still may be a very small dose. And that's what um, researchers haven't worked out yet, is what is the critical dose that actually causes it. And so it's only after you've had a pregnancy loss or you had a, a baby, I don't know if you've seen movies like the Erin Brockovich and all that. It needs yeah. people to be talking about these things so that you can actually work out. Yes, of course you need uh, plastics for many things, but you do need that open conversation to happen. And um, again, putting people who are in the more marginalized groups, you know, getting that voice and getting that education so that you can actually understand your own body and then decide, OK, what am I going to put in my mouth? What am I? Am I can I change my environment? Can I change what I put on my skin, what I put inside my vagina? Those things are so, so important that I just feel that awareness is lacking yeah. and Thank that you. is from a whole series of, of um, you know organizations letting us down yeah and and really really great points and I'd love to, us to do a poll at some point as well even just with our audience to say do you know the difference between your vagina and your vulva I mean that would be a great <laughs> live poll to do right now um, <laughs> So I think I only learned about five years ago, probably through my work with City to Sea. So we have got like a weird um, noise going on here. I'm not sure how much our viewers can actually hear it. They're fine. The viewers can't hear it. Hopefully you can't hear it. There's just like a high pitched noise. Nat, just on. to add in here, I think it might be um, Dr. Neetu. Would you mind muting in between conversations? Let's and see we'll see. Makes it I, have, I have actually been muted most of the time. Ah, I okay. think, yeah, I think that would help potentially. No, it didn't help. But anyway, I'll okay. come back to you. Thank, <laughs> thank, you. thank, thank you. you for that. Anyway, we can ignore it as long as you're not suffering from it, um, from watching at home. So um, great. So we'll probably run for another sort of 10, 15 minutes, taking any more questions. I'd really love us to sort of be talking about solutions as well and, and you know, what we think we can do. It stopped. Um, Sophie, <laughs> did you have another question there for us? Or should we go back to one of mine? Super. Sophie's still recovering from dealing with that little technical hitch. Um, so I think you started to touch on then, Dr. Nitu, about what we can do to protect ourselves. Um, and then we'll talk about like how can we amplify and what are the leverage points of how we might want to bring about change. Um, but in terms of like protecting ourselves and the environment, um, I'll just come back to you very quickly, Dr. Nitu. You said about um, being conscious about what we put in our mouths and our bodies. Are there any sort of easy ways for people to know how to avoid that? I mean, generally I say to people, try organic is generally a pretty safe way to do it. But what, what sort of ways would you say that are accessible and inclusive that people can do? So studies actually haven't shown necessarily that organic is better. Uh, and so people often think that organic means no uh, chemicals and it's, you know, no nasty chemicals and it doesn't really work like that. And so people may be priced out on, on those things. Yes, if you can actually organize certain things to be, um, or you can buy certain things that are organic, that's great, but you don't have to go fully organic because the science isn't still backing that up. Uh, what you do need to think about is, what are you putting on your skin? What are you putting in your mouth? And how aware are you of your work circumstances? Because it is 
very possible that you're being exposed to quite a lot of work uh, toxins, whether it is in the medical field or whether it is uh, you're a cleaner or you're handling a lot of uh, chemicals. That's important. Mm. The second thing is, can you change the amount of um, the air pollution that is around you? Are, are you privileged enough to be able to live in a place where you have trees and things like that? And the other important thing that we are talking about now is, of course, the, the aspect of period. So choosing products that really are both kind to your body as well as to the environment. So, you know, a natural care is one. And of course, uh, reusable pads and pants and, and things like that, period pants. These are moon cup. I think um, Maria was talking about that. These are great alternatives that are more sustainable and, and you don't have to dispose them off because, you know, a woman will go through 10,000 menstrual products in her lifetime if she's having one, two or three children, because we said, you know, one has about 500 cycles, so you can multiply, uh, you know, an average cycle of five days. So I think just being aware that there are, there is possibility that if you're planning to get pregnant, if you're having your periods are not coming between the 24 and 35 days, if they don't have a pattern, if you are planning a pregnancy, what are you putting into your body, both you know, when you're eating, as well as what you're putting on your skin, you know, using feminine wipes, using all these sprays, they all come chock full. You know, your house may smell nice, you may smell nice, but actually you're probably doing yourself. I always say the vagina is a self-cleansing uh, cleansing oven. It doesn't need help from us. So it's so important to just be aware of your body and make those little changes. Thank you. My vagina is a self-cleansing oven. I love that. <laughs> Temple, maybe even. Um, thank you. Um, Charlotte and, and Susie as well, I'd love to hear from you, well, all of you on that. But um, in terms of... Um, in terms of our environment, like how can we protect our, our planet more and, and our, our waterways and our soils? I mean, I think... A lot of it is exactly what Dr. Nitya has just said, because, you know, the same applies if we can um, reduce the amount of um, kind of disposable products that we're using. I think that is a good thing. That's not always possible. And there are better alternatives um, out there um, that, um, that enable us to move away from the kind of conventional, very plastic heavy, um, uh, additive heavy um, products. Um, but anything that we can do, just small steps to, as you say, just be aware of everything that you're using on your, your body. You then, you slather yourself in some very nice, probably extremely expensive body lotion, but then you get in the shower and, you know, wash a lot of that off. And then that goes into the wastewater system. Um, so a lot of those chemicals, if they've not already been absorbed into your skin, you're washing them into the um, into the into the wastewater. And so they're still getting into the the environment that way. So just trying to be mindful, again, about what you're using, exactly echoing what Dr. Nito just said. Um, the other thing that I would add um, is that when we are um, analyzing plastics in the lab, one of the one of the main methods that we use um, is microwave extraction. So, so we put the plastics in, um, in a lab microwave system um, with water or solvent to get the chemicals out of the plastics so that we can analyze them. So don't microwave your food in plastic pots <laughs> because, um, you know, those chemicals very readily come out of plastic when you microwave it that's why it's a very efficient method yeah. for extracting it in the lab so all so, of those ready meals that come in plastics that yeah, are, say microwavable yeah decant leaching. it onto china and top then, tip and then important. microwave it i don't put any plastic in my microwave yeah. <laughs> because i watch my plastics in the lab yeah in the microwave yeah, yeah. and go oh no! great great and extraction. you shouldn't store um Natalie, you shouldn't store uh, your food in plastics or water. These are important things, which is a very important point uh, because it can cause insulin resistance and again, polycystic ovary syndrome and other medical conditions are also uh, implicated and even certain uh, cancers may be implicated. We don't have enough research on that, but insulin resistance certainly, which is one of the big issues for type two diabetes and which is one of the top chronic killers in our, in, in the, in the world. So uh, yes, simple things like, yeah. you know, not heating food, not storing food in plastics, you know, go back to stainless steel or yeah. glass, yeah. it's so much easier. Yeah. 
Thank you. Really important. So like freezing, so actually having sort of more like glass containers and other ways of freezing that aren't plastics as well as heating and storing them. Thank you. Great point. Um, so we'll Always probably... Think for, Go on. Natalie, the other thing is uh, BPA-free cans, because when you, it's fine to have canned food, no problem at all, but you do want to uh, avoid uh, the cans that contain BPA. So you have to look for that sign. And of course, as Susie said, they may be a little subtle. They might put in something else <laughs> under that guise, but at least you know it's not got BPA. Mm -hmm. Similarly, handling the, the receipts that you get in a till, yeah. avoid, just say, I don't want a receipt. And I always tell the shop uh, tellers, please wear gloves when you're handling those yeah. because they are, are full of lots and lots of, of, uh, of chemicals. Yeah. That was a horrific study that came out that showed that accountants were getting, you know, sick yeah. from having handled so many receipts. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I try not to touch them anymore. Um, just say you don't want it. <laughs> yeah, good point. And save on paper, save on printing. Um, so we'll probably be able to take another few questions. Um, I'm going to ask another question of the panel and then we'll come back to you, our viewers. Um, so I think, like, looking at how we can make a change. Susie, we've heard from you. You you were like, I'm going to challenge the industry by creating a, a disruptive brand. And, you know, huge kudos to, to you for, for, for doing that so successfully and, and um, tirelessly over the years. I'm sure you have been tired in that time, but, you know. <laughs> um, but, Maria, so you were inspired to sort of tell your story and do that through the medium of film. Like, how did you go about that? You know, how, how might other people um, you know, um, sort of get involved and, and make a change? change themselves. Yeah, it was quite natural for me because I'm a filmmaker and oh. storyteller. So <laughs> Place I, your strengths. Yeah, I had the story and I was like, what do I do with it? Um, and so that was that was a really nice outlet for me. It's like quite cathartic and things like that. But I think I always say to people, like one of the most amazing things, especially about your cycle, is that it's really unique to you. So in, like in every aspect and length and like the bleed and stuff like that. And that's like quite a... That I found that quite empowering for myself to know like how I feel is quite valid and that gave me a more confident voice. And so I always encourage people to listen to themselves a lot more instead of like constantly reading like I should feel like this or my period should look like this, I should use this product. Use a product, you know, think about how you feel using it and then like go with that and it kind of adds on to um, what we were saying just before, like, I think in terms of what you're choosing to put in your body, it will be different for someone else. So if you're eating something and it doesn't feel right, but it feels right for your partner, ignore that and make the note for yourself, this doesn't sit well with me. And I, I feel like that's where the change starts to come when instead of constantly focusing on like what everyone else is saying and what's happening in the outside world, we can take a moment to kind of think like, how am I really feeling mm. about this right now? I love that element of Maria on the panel tonight, just bringing it back to body wisdom. And it's something like in our busy world, it's, you know, there's so much information out there and we forget that our bodies no, and they're so wise. So if we can still it down and yeah. and listen, I love that. And also, you know how you have used your your talent as a way to 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 respond to that question of well, what more can I do? You've kind of taken it through through your means, and for you, Charlotte, it's it's through your research and sort of and amplifying that. Um, how can people sort of get more involved or or make a change? Like, what can people do? Do you think sort of around EDCs from your perspective? I think. Uh, spread the word, <laughs> I mm. think, will be the, the, the thing. Um, I mean, we're trying very hard to um, allow the science to catch up and have a growing body of evidence that we can put forward to regulators so that we say, look, we really do need to regulate these things and now um, because, um, you know, traditionally regulations come in because we discover that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but by the time that regulation comes in, the problem's already happened. Yeah. Um, and so it will be, um, you know, great to be able to um, stir things up a little bit to try and move that forward because I think it is very difficult, um, you know, to to join the science up with the policy. It, it, it is a tricky thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's something that um, that I've been working quite hard to do to kind of build those links with, with policymakers. But they need the hard evidence <laughs> as well in order to uh, make them act. The big companies are not going to change what they're doing unless 
they've got motivation to do that. Um, and as you said, it's exactly the same with the nappy industry. So I think it is about raising public awareness and to, you know, you, you can see the impact of actually the power of the public and their reaction to these things when it comes to combined sewer overflows, which we've seen all over the news mm. quite recently. And actually, um, there's lots of there's lots of talk and there's lots of things going on now, I think partly driven by the fact that everyone was so appalled. So if we can be so appalled yeah. and try and spur some action, um, then I think that's probably um, one of the, the most powerful ways that we can kind of take this forward and we'll squirrel away trying to yeah. get the extra scientific evidence that, that that's needed. We're here for you to make, make <laughs> a splash when, when, that, when that comes out. We've worked with some other organisations sort of amplifying that scientific the findings and you know I think that's where it can work isn't it with working up with communicators and, and media and Absolutely. yeah so yeah. people watching at home like that's one thing that you can do you can you can share the links you can share this recording when it's out there you can connect and um, with people here so that when we do have those kind of um new studies and and um that we can actually then get them out there um, Susie, what about you? Like what, I mean, other than, you know, switching to, to, to um, plastic-free period products, like what, what do you feel like people, what else can people do to get involved and, and make a change? I think you all, we all have to be um, independent campaigners <clears throat> uh, and joined up voices um, because the industry will use the absence of evidence as a reason to, to continue doing what they're doing. Um, and, you know, as we already know, there's a lot of research that's, paid for by the manufacturers and even in work on EDCs, a lot of it defending the use of them is uh, industry finance. Mm. There's very little research money coming in to, to look for these. So I think we, we independently have to be little micro campaigners and make sure we, you know, you can write your MP, but probably wouldn't do a lot of good. Um, you have to write to the companies join up with campaigning organisations. Here in the UK, we've got Women's Environmental Network. In the US, there's Women's Voices for the Earth. There, are, there is a similar organisation in South Korea. They're around. Um, the more noise you make, the more, of a, more of a pain in the side, the more you point to regulation of full disclosure of ingredients, whether they're... Um, when they say, when, when an industry says um, not, not intentionally added, it means that they intentionally haven't tried to find out what the ingredients are of those ingredients that they're putting into those products. So they need Worst to be challenged. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a war of words. Yeah. So um, challenge the brands, ask them the questions, don't be fobbed off by you know the, the pat on the head answers. Um, and for me personally, I will continue to um, you know, connect up with people who are doing research to get testing. Um, and, and call out where there's greenwashing about hidden chemicals yeah, in products. Really important, really important, especially as like innovation, especially on the period um, sort of product marketplace mm. is really booming. Oh, you're yes. getting lots of sort of startups and <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, good. Glad you're glad you're on it, Susie. Um, so Sophie, have we got any more? We've got a couple time for a couple more questions from our viewers. How many have we got? Just so I get a sense of how many we're going to try and get through. I mean, we. We've got a few. You've got a few. <laughs> okay, let's hear them. So we've got Amrin asking, how do we encourage more research in particular, the research element, um, on the impacts of chemicals to our environment? Great question, Charlotte. How do, how do, we, get, how do we help you get funding? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's pretty difficult. I think the, you know, the, there is motivation, like the scientists are there trying, like doing doing the work and um, and there is some funding out there. As I said, the Royal Society are currently uh, funding me um, on a research fellowship for the next uh, five years plus. So, um, and there are various other projects that I'm in, I'm involved with. I think um, it's very difficult to influence exactly. <laughs> where the money goes. Um, it's all done on competitive um, bids. So scientists will come up with an idea. We have to write applications and we submit them to um, to, to funding bodies. They'll then be um, expertly reviewed, and then uh, you know success rates on these things are anywhere in the region of kind of five to 10%. So for every, um, you know, 10 applications that we put in that might take weeks to prepare, we yeah. may get one of them yeah. <laughs> if we're lucky. Um, so 
I think it's very difficult to, yeah. to influence, but I think the important thing is that, um, you know, the scientists are very motivated, like everyone who's working in this, in this area are very passionate. You know, it's, it's part of our, our being, if you like. You know, it's, um, it's not only just our day job, it, it is life. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, so I think be reassured that we are trying. Yeah. And, <laughs> and there's uh, another um, Bristol-based, uh, are they Bristol-based anymore? Anyway, another um, plastic campaigning organisation called Common Seeds recently released the report about plastic in our blood and, and their call to action was asking for government to invest more in, in research into, into plastic in our blood and, and generally um, plastic and, and chemicals as well. So I guess sort of, you know, signing those petitions, sharing them is another way that we can actually um, then, you know, amplify that and get more people, more people involved. Um, Dr. Nietzsche, in the medical profession, like how can people that are watching that may be working in the NHS or, or they might be um, health professionals themselves, what can they do to, um, um, what was the question again? I've completely flew out of my head. So basically for research, she, she heard it. first of all, there has yeah. to be awareness. Um, most doctors are not aware of EDCs. They don't even know what they are. OK, uh, and when you don't know what they are, just like the general public, how are you going to um, you know, talk about it? So I think also there are a lot of vested interests. There has to be a reason why you want to uh, investigate this or research this. And historically, a lot of research has never happened in aspects that do not benefit the big industries. Mm. So it's our job as um, you know, public awareness campaigns and actually demanding change that's going to drive research because it's otherwise very hard for scientists and PhD students to really get those grants that they really want to work on that are not being allowed simply because of the fact that the money is being taken into something else. And many of these um, um, grants are, are, or companies often run their own slightly biased uh, or very biased, uh, you know, studies which then come out. So instead, what you need is the government coming on board and actually really funding these openly, these these uh, studies that will actually help everybody long term. But, you know, it's a big ask. There's so much you can see the way our politics is in complete disarray. Yeah. People have so many vested interests that research has to be driven and it's only through public, you know, the people taking taking charge good thank you so yeah so demand it it's it's up to you um but it's not just up to you obviously um it's not all your responsibility but you know i no, think no uh, but we have to we yeah. have to shout louder and doing because, like what you're doing sort of um you know using yeah, your voice within your yeah. within your industry running industry events you know within your circles um fabulous all right so we'll take i think maybe we'll do two more quick questions um, and then we'll wrap up and let you get on with your evenings or mornings if you're in a different part of the world. We've got a couple of people from New Zealand, so it is morning. Oh, OK, good. Um, morning, <laughs> we've got a uh, question. This is a very practical question, and I think it's been answered in the comments, but I think it's worth asking. Um, how do you clean your washable pads? What is a good way of doing that? Um, and this is from Alex as a uni student. Um, so only does laundry once a fortnight. <laughs> Thanks. That's a great question. Do you know, I got asked that today at an event, um, literally that question. Um, so, I mean, we do a lot of work with reusable period products here at City to See and within our, our period um, education program, Rethink Periods, we talk about that as well. Um, which camera am I going? Can I get a little over there? Um, hi. And so, I mean, generally that the, you can just rinse them out, you can leave them in a bucket um, and then put them in the wash when you have them. I tend to wash them on a pretty low, um, like sort of still on 40 degrees, they're fine, but then my flow isn't that heavy. So I think it depends um, on the flow. Um, have any of you, have you done any things? Have you kind of put them in a little bit of hydrogen peroxide? Have you done anything <laughs> else to... I mean, some some of the um... you just need to soak it in in some hot water, rinse it out, and then when your um, the person who's asking the question is going to the laundry, you know, take them uh, and and uh, to the washing machine if they don't want to wash it by hand. But otherwise, it's pretty simple. You don't need to use anything very fancy if you're using period pants or reusable pads. 
just some good old water. We'll we'll get it, you know, when it's fresh, just rinse it out and it should be absolutely fine. You don't need to use lots of chemicals in it. And you can use an eco egg or something like that in the washing machine if that's what you're using, um, you know, to try and reduce the amount of chemicals because there are a lot of chemicals in our laundry detergent still. There are, yeah, I thank actually, you, thank you. I, um, I have mine in the shower and so when I'm showering, I just stick them on the bath floor and I just let them drain mm. <laughs> in the shower and then stick them in the washing basket after. Trample on them like crushing yeah, grapes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> just exactly that. Like yeah. it's just you're already in the shower anyway, so you might as well use yeah. that water. Um, I've heard people doing that with their cups as well, yeah. like just literally emptying them in the shower. Yeah. Um, okay, another question from our viewers. Thank you, by the way, people who are um, engaging with us and sending in your questions. We really appreciate that. It's lovely to be having a conversation with you. Um, Sophie. This is a question from it's either Claudie or Claudie. Um, and um, they say, as a woman that has gone through the menopause, I wonder whether the epidemic of difficult menopause symptoms is a legacy of a lifetime of endocrine disrupting chemicals. Wow. That's... Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, uh, Dr. Need to, Susie, I think, Susie, would you like to I'm a lifelong vegetarian. I only ever eat organic food and I hardly had a menopause. I have to say I'd never noticed was it? Was that it? Gone? Um, I think everybody is individual. Um, it, it, it could be, but there's no science, mm. and that's the problem. You know, the, we need the science. We need to. We have to need this evidence base so we can bring about change. Unless there's the science there, policymakers are not going to listen. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So it yeah. is. So it, there is a, there is a little bit of evidence to suggest. Um, if you look at the scientific body, uh, that um, uh, premature ovarian insufficiency or early menopause may be brought on because of the endocrine disrupting chemicals affecting the number of eggs that you have in your ovaries. And so they tend to die off earlier. And so you have a, the critical level is reached earlier. So, but there is not enough research yet uh, to show. So yes, you can imagine that the symptoms itself Probably not, but of course, again, we don't have the research, as, as Susie says, but uh, there is evidence to suggest that reduced fertility as well as um, earlier menopause may be affected by the EDCs that we are exposed to. Uh, because again, it may be different individuals who respond to it differently to the, the amount of dose that you're exposed to. Mm. Thank you, thank you both. So I think we'll we'll um, we'll wrap up with um, one final question for our panelists, and um, really just a sort of uh, a top line sort of if. Um Actually, I was going to ask you what's the one thing that people can do, but actually I think we've talked about that a bit. I'd, I'd maybe say what are your kind of closing um, comments or anything that we haven't talked about tonight that you would like to communicate to our viewers? Um, Susie, are you happy for me to start with you? Do you want yeah. a bit more time to think about it? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, for me, it's been a life, you know, starting out as a campaign. It's For me, it's never stopped being a campaign. I mean, it's a business, obviously, but it's never stopped being a campaign. And it is, tires it is tiresome to have to keep repeating the same things over and over again. Mm. And you see the same mistakes being perpetuated in the industry without any recourse to that um, and the greenwashing that goes with it. So, um, but I think... We have to be optimistic that there are enough, there's enough people out there who really are concerned about the build-up of plastic in our environment and the, the, the visual impact it has. The conversation about the hidden impact should be an easy sell mm. because we already see it there. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm the eternal optimist because that's the only way you can continue. Mm. Um, so really, I'd say... I've done, I've done, I've done a lot. I'm continuing to do a lot um, because I've, you know, my connection with the environment uh, and nature is so strong, um, you know, that I feel that it's been, it's not, it's been known to me to help to protect it, and and we and we have to be aware that the environment isn't somewhere you visit on a day pass. It's our habitat, and without a, a viable habitat. We're, we're toast, basically. Well, no, that's acrylamide, isn't it? That's even worse. <laughs> um, yeah, no burnt bits. No burnt bits. <laughs> Please. Um, so <clears throat> I continue because, I've, because I'm committed. Yeah. Um, but people can make a difference by 
finding out what the products are that they're that they're choosing to to use every day mm, thank you Susie Charlotte yeah I think I'd echo everything that Susie said um I'd also say that um you know, use an analogy that I've heard in the kind of climate <laughs> debate um, that, you know, a lot of these a lot of these things, um, you know, there are kind of tipping points involved. And so, you know, sometimes it's hard to feel like, well, if I change what I'm doing, is that really going to make a massive difference? It's just me and there are million, you know, billions of us on the planet. Um, but actually, at some point, that one person who decides to, to make a change might actually just drop us below that threshold that, that really helps. Mm. So um, it can be easy. I mean, even for me, you know, I it's my it's my day job my 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 life job if 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 you like but you know even i struggle sometimes to see that oh, okay well you know is it really going to make a difference but i think we have to believe that each one of us can make a difference because mm. if you know all of us decide that individually then together we do make a difference so um i think it's quite easy to get very um um kind of caught up in our everyday lives and i've you know we're all so busy um and I think, you know, taking that time to really think about, you know, your health, as you said, listening to your listening to your body um, and um, and just think about the simple things that you can change. Um, so during um, lockdowns, when I was at home, I was actually on maternity leave um, during COVID times. So um, I wasn't trying to work from home, but I was looking after two kids. But I was sat there looking at my house and trying to work out where I could rid my house of various mm. chemicals. So it was at that point that I threw out all the um, the plastic period products that I wasn't using at that point anyway. Um, and I never went back to them. I changed from bottled shampoo to bars um, and, you know, just went around the house to work out what were the easy things I could swap. Mm. Um, you know, and I don't miss any of those things. <laughs> yeah. um, so actually, it can be relatively simple, but we just need to take the time to actually sit, sit and think about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. great points. Thanks, Charlotte. Mm. What you just said reminds me of this quote that I saw today. I was like pulling from a bigger quote, and there was a line in it that just said, "An activist is a person who decides to do something." And I just really like that because it feels achievable for anybody then, yeah. you know, like choose where you want to be on the scale yeah. and then just do something. Yeah. Um, but what I wanted to leave with was my two top resources Yeah. <laughs> because I'm also, I just love research and I love reading. Um, but the book that changed my life um, and I think is a great place to start for like body, aut body autonomy is the Period Repair Manual by Lara Bryden. Period Repair, repair Manual. manual. And she also has another book called The Hormone Repair Manual, which is great for perimenopause and menopausal health. Okay. That's yeah. really helpful. Really, like... We'll maybe do a little circle round as well of, like, um, you know, links and where people can find out more. But, yeah, yeah great. Yeah, like you're most... You, you know, where you went for inspiration and guidance. Um, any closing comments from yourself, Dr. Nitu? Yeah, I... I... I think it's first of all fantastic that you put this uh, together because I think it'll really help uh, people understand uh, that there is a lot that is happening in the background and that nobody should feel that they can't make a difference. I think it's there's a lot of hope. Um, the younger generation definitely are, um, you know, making the right noises and making sure that you know they, nobody wants to be left in a situation. It's going to affect all of us, but even more so. The younger generations. So I think don't just sit back and assume that, you know, there are a lot of industries that are doing great work. There Some are and some aren't. So if you see something that doesn't seem right, it doesn't look right, it probably isn't right. So do try and bring awareness into that. And I'd also say educate yourself. Always read reliable scientific resources. Empower yourself with that knowledge rather than being influenced by, you know, wellness uh, or um, influencers on social media who may not have the scientific background and don't have, uh, often make broad sweeping statements without the science being backing it up. Because scientists spend a lot of time, they don't, most scientists will not have any vested interests. They want to really get the truth out there and energize yourself because this is a fantastic uh, opportunity you know to be alive and to be a woman and actually make a difference so i always say educate empower energize yourself and nobody knows your body better than you so listen to it and actually take those that those cues and seek the right help amazing 
wise words. Thank you so much for sharing those. Um, so then final kind of whiz round, where can people go to find out more information? You know, it might be connecting with you personally on your social media, or it might be um, like, you know, a book recommendation or, or a website. Um, Dr. Nietzsche, let's start with you. You've got a book, haven't you? I'm definitely going to <laughs> yes. because the first part is all about understanding your periods and why it's a vital sign and a lot of myth busting. It's called Living PCOS Free. It's about how to regain your hormonal health, understanding how EDCs also affect insulin resistance and the most common endocrine condition that affects women, which one in 10 women have it, but three out of four women don't know about it and never get a diagnosis. Also, I think it's important to look at reliable resources, but I am on social media, not because I enjoy it, but because <laughs> I think it's a great way of spreading information. So I am on Instagram as well with my name at Dr. Neetu Bajekal and on TikTok as well as I have a website that has about 50 or 60 free fact sheets. You don't need to buy the book if you don't want to. You can read most of my information, whether it's on menopause or perimenopause or on lifestyle medicine or on any gynecological condition, neetubajekal.com. I'm sure you can put it in the footnotes uh, later. We can. Thank you and congratulations yeah. on the book as well. It's yes, the next book is on menopause. So. <laughs> is on menopause? On, on Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> Great. Um, hopefully one for you, Claudia, if you're still watching. Um, Maria, top tips? Where can, where can people find you? Um, I've, I'm on YouTube, Maria Webb. And that's got some period videos on there and some film videos um, or Instagram falling films. Falling films. Underscore. <laughs> yeah, falling films underscore. And that's got all the film work. And we'll have um, information about fake blood, which is the short coming out about periods. Great. Looking forward to seeing that. Thank you. Charlotte. Yeah, uh, so another potential book recommendation, one that I read because I didn't know much about the kind of human health side of things. Um, and I came across a book um, by Shana Swan, who's a US um, academic um, uh, called Countdown. Um, and that is looking at exactly some of these things that we were talking about, um, looking at the evidence for the studies they do have, um, long longer term studies now on linking um, the um, chemicals from plastics to um, some of these fertility um, problems. So it kind of documents her kind of research um, that she's been doing over the last few um, decades, uh, working with US women. And it, and it documents the fact that um, the um, Western world sperm count is basically on a massive decline. Yeah. Um, and that um, if we don't do something about it soon, um, then you know we're gonna be in, <laughs> in big problems. So that was um, a big, uh, a big eye opener for me and I think there was a bit of media coverage when it came out but like all of these yeah. things it then kind of quietens down again and then it yeah. just kind of disappears. And there's a lot of information out there as well. Absolutely it? yeah, yeah. Um, Great. so Good. our kind of science research my current research um, again I'm on I'm on Twitter um, so Dr. Charl Lloyd um, so you can find me if you're interested in the kind of you know day-to-day -day, um, workings of what we, um, we do as scientists and we we, we then um, do um, post links to things that we're publishing and that kind of thing. Great. Thank you. Susie. Well, um, and at NatureCare, um, naturecare.com, we have a lot of information on there. Um, we're on Instagram, etc. cetera. Um, it's th there's links from, from the website, and it's N-A-T-R-A. Yeah. C-A-R-A dot com. Yeah. Um, <laughs> however you want to pronounce it. Um, I haven't written a book. If I ever written a book, I'd probably be in jail because I've got so much conspiracy and knowledge about what's gone on in the do industry. It, do <laughs> it, yeah. do it, do yeah. it. Corruption, crime, all sorts of things <gasps> uh, in the industry. <clears throat> um, but for me personally, I would recommend, I mean, I, I met the fabulous Polly Higgins many, many years back and I became a signatory to um, the Eco Justice. And, and I would say pick any of Polly Higgins' books um, because I think that if the crime of... Of, 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 of eco justice eco uh, become eco science yeah. becomes um, you know one of the fifth human rights. Then those who are responsible for not making changes that are impacting on our on our planet and on our health will have to pay restorative 
will be subject to restorative justice. And that involves the manufacturers, the producers, the banks that finance them yeah. and everything else. Um, and that needs the power of, 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 of citizens too, because the UN, many countries have already agreed to pass and the U EU is pretty close. Um, yeah. So if you really want to influence at the top down, that's where to go. Yeah. So read any of Polly's books. Yeah, and or just look you. online for um, Stop Ecocide. Just Ecocide, thank um, you. Fantastic. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, I personally have just really enjoyed this conversation. I was like, no, we won't go for two hours. I know we said it would be two hours. I was like, no, it'll, we'll, we'll, you know, an hour will be fine. But like, we're nearly here at at nearly eight o'clock um, UK time. And uh, I could literally talk for another hour on this subject or longer. Um, so maybe we'll have to do a part two <laughs> next year. Um, so this event was inspired and is part of Environmental Week. So a big shout out to the Women's Environmental Network um, for curating and organizing Environmental Week. It's a great sort of week of the year. Um, so thanks to them for that. Um, and of course, an extra special thanks going out to Nature Care um, that um, Susie's been representing tonight as a campaigning organisation. Um, and thanks very much for sponsoring tonight's event. We appreciate it. Um, thank you to you, our panellists, Dr. Nitu. It's felt like you've been in the room. This has been amazing. I've loved having you here with us. Thanks for dialing in. Um, so Dr. Uh, Dr. Nitu Bajekal, thank you. Maria Webb. Thank you, um, Charlotte Lloyd and Susie Hewson. All of you have been fantastic. I've loved the wisdom and the experience that you've brought and the passion as well. And I think, you know, for that, um, you know, carrying us forward, of like sustaining ourselves, it's really obvious that you have that passion within you. And I think whatever small act or big act we take in, in making the world a better place, it's that passion, isn't it, that, that can carry us, um, whether or not our actions make a difference or not, which obviously we hope they do. Um, so uh, obviously a huge thank you to you for dialing in, tuning in, um, watching us online uh, and supporting it. Um, so thank you for being here. I hope it's been informative. I hope you've enjoyed the discussions. I hope you've learned something. Um, so to find out more about exposure from period products, there's a great blog over on uh, NaturCare's website. Susie told you about that earlier. It's on naturcare.com on their plastic free section. Um, and obviously, if you want to know more about plastic free periods, if you want to get more behind the campaign um, and how we can turn the tide on plastics ending up in our rivers and seas, then obviously you can um, join City to Sea. You can sign up to our plastic free journal, which goes out once a month um, and visit our website. Especially we've got our Rethink Periods education program as well. So if you are connected to a school, if you're a parent, if you're a local council and you want to find out more about our education program, then get in touch hopefully you're following us on all the channels um you know city to seas on instagram twitter um all of those things um finally it was a free event if you want to make a donation to city to see you are very welcome to do that um obviously head over to our website there's a big donate button um if you want to uh, help power the work that we do here um then that would be much appreciated um, so yeah, keep up the good fight. Thanks very much for tuning in and a huge shout to our AV team and to Sophie who's been getting the questions in from City to See, our Plastic Free Periods team. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great evening. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.